नमस्कार हेलो टू एवरीबॉडी एंड वेलकम टू द थर्ड इवनिंग ऑफ दिस सीरीज ऑफ फाइव कॉन्वर्सेशंस दिस इज बीन ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय आर्ट विजन इन कोलैबोरेशन विद इंडिया एबिटेक सेंटर and uh, it is in celebration of the 25th anniversary of art vision art vision was founded uh, in 1996 by a group of artists belonging to different disciplines like uh, dance art literature cinema theater and continuing on this pr- premises we are uh, celebrating the 25th year with uh, an event which uh, uh, is called dance across genres where experts in different disciplines will share their talk to us tonight is uh, the third evening and uh, it is uh, dance and visual arts is uh, when uh, we dance we paint figures in the air when we choreograph with design movements in the space among all the arts dance is certainly the most antique without knowing dance how the silpakars could have carved sculptures around the walls of the temples with such precise details of hasta mudra and fit positions text like silpa shastra give indications regarding diagrams lines and proportions but finally is only the dancing body and its designs in space which brings those diagrams to life and inspires painters and sculptors to try to capture them so tonight we have with us a, a very renowned expert in visual art is uh, alka pande dr alka pande She is uh, an art historian who taught Indian art and aesthetic at Punjab University for more than 10 years. Her major fields of interest are gender identity and sexuality and traditional arts. Dr. Pandey under the ages of the Char- Charles Wallace Indian Trust conducted postdoctoral research in critical art theory. at Goldsmith University of London she has been awarded the knight of the order of arts and letters by the french government for her significant contribution in the field of art and literature the australian india council special award for her contribution to indian art and the l'oréal paris femina women under design and art Currently Dr Pande is a consultant art advisor and curator of the Visual Arts Gallery and the India Habitat Center in New Delhi. So we will now listen to the presentation of Dr Pande on dance and visual art. And before that I would like to ask you to just um, at the end of the presentation if you have any question please uh, write the question in the chat box or if you want to come on screen then raise your hand and we unmute your mic so dr pande we can start the presentation i believe alka pande is with us thank you Let me also congratulate you on the 
थैंक यू बीच बीच में आके देखना पड़ेगा ना कि ठीक चल रहा है कि नहीं Thank you Eliana for the wonderful introduction and thank you very much for collaborating with us here at the India Habitat Center in celebrating your very iconic 25 years silver jubilee celebrations of art vision Let me also congratulate you on behalf of the Visual Arts Gallery India Habitat Center and all of us that you have so consistently worked with such dedication and perseverance in setting up and running your art center in bhubaneswar your commitment to the arts and to your practice of dance is truly commendable many many congratulations and i hope you have many many wonderful years ahead to continue uh, in your endeavor to push the boundaries of dance and art ab kuch log kuch abhi mujhe nahi dikh raha hai when you came with the suggestion of doing a collaboration uh i love the idea of what you had suggested dance across genres and this is truly interesting and and your curation of inviting a cross section of people from alistair theatre julia parvati and me to bring our own understanding and interpretation of dance uh to our own practices uh was very very attractive and for me in particular because i truly believe in my pursuit of indian art and heritage that there is such a interdisciplinary connection between all the arts no art really grows or flowers in a silo dance cannot be uh delinked to poetry as poetry cannot be delinked to uh music as music cannot be delinked to abstraction which we all sorry uh, again the voice is gone now it's like the dancer uses the body in geometric forms in curvilinear forms in static forms and uh me being a a, a practitioner of dance many many years ago in another life when i was much younger and more mobile learned bharatanatyam from yamini krishnamurthy and learned exactly how the control of the body can also uh, you know uh, bring a certain kind of gravitas 
to, uh, uh, to, to, to the form. And that form, the gravitas of a physical bodily form can also be seen in the gravitas of an artist, of a painter, of a sculptor using materials to make lines. Um, you know, I want to go back to the very beginning. I want to go back to the very beginning of thought. I want to go back to the very beginnings of how for us, mankind started to paint, to draw and to dance. Now we don't know what really came first. Did the line come first or did the dancing come first? Because when we look at the deep caves, whether it is Bhim Ghedka, whether it is the caves in Altamira in Spain, we see a lot of drawings which are done. And these drawings are all line-based drawings. And many of these line-based drawings represent dance. Is it magic? Is it fertility? Is it the dance for the gods? Is it dancing for the elements? Studies are still carrying on, but definitely we can, we can, uh, we are free to assume and understand that it has a lot to do with fertility, with magic, with fantasy, with our own um, fear sometimes, because the paintings of the caves show hunting scenes. So is it all about power? Is it about beauty? Is it about aesthetics? But today, I really want to begin first with our Shilpa Shastras. I want to also lean heavily on an essay, on a book which I find very, very um, interesting for me. Uh, is called The Circle and the Square by one of India's leading scholars on Indian art and aesthetics with the uh, recently uh, passed Kapila Vatsayan, who had also footprinted a lot of what we call Indian arts and aesthetics. Um, while Dr. Vatsayan was a trained uh, dancer, she was also a trained art historian. And for today's talk, I thought that taking this particular title of one of her books, The Circle and the Square, would be an interesting way for me to express my own absorptions and concerns and uh, engagements with dance, music, sculpture, and painting. So I go back to the very early times when we say that dance has been a subject explored by many of the world's most respected artists. This form of expression has played a very, very important role in human life for thousands of years. From early participatory dance to performance dance as we know today. Um, I want to go back to our Shilpa Shastras. I'm not even going back to the Natya Shastra yet. Natya Shastra will feature later as we go along in, in, in my presentation. But <clears throat> I want to go back to the Shilpa Shastras, which were written somewhere around the anywhere from the 5th to the 7th century of the Common Era. As you know, in <clears throat> Indian art, most of our texts, most of our knowledge is really received wisdom. It is only in the, um, say, the, uh, from, from the time of the fourth century of the Common Era, uh, where the Natya Veda or the Natya Shastra, which is also known as the fifth Veda, was actually inscribed by Bharat, known as Bharat Muni, who wrote the Natya Shastra. The Shilpa Shastras were also being 
kind of collated and codified and like many things of Indian, traditional Indian art, we do not really know exactly who was an author, was it a collective voice. Of course, we do know people who collated the wisdom, the Indic wisdom of our forefathers and our ancestors. So going back to the Shilpa Shastras, I want to mention that the motif which was taken or how the body of a human being was reduced to vertical and horizontal lines. And from vertical and horizontal lines, what do you get? You get the square and the circle. The measure was conditioned by the medium of expression, the standing man with his arms outstretched, rather upstretched, recalling the Vedic description, he is as broad as he is high. With this square frame and the space of a circle, a whole cosmos is contained, equating again the different parts of his or her limbs and organs with different lines and intersections on one plane and the different elements of the universe on the other. In fact, I'm going to go to Dan Brown's book when he did the whole thing of the Da Vinci Code and the cover of his book was Leonardo Da Vinci's The Truvian Man where he's standing and there too, if you look at the lines, it's the circle and the square. Um, I have some images actually, which I'd like to now share with you uh, when I start a little bit. And I want to um, uh, show you how um, I want to, uh, you know, lay out the course of my talk. And I wanted to call it Dancing with the Line, Dance and Visual Arts. Um, see, this is the way uh, I wanted to show you some sculptures, which if you see, uh, these are temple sculptures and I will show them to you by and by. But I want to show you how the exploration of the line is happening how the Rekha, we call it the Rekha. You can see in the, in the thicker lines, charcoal lines, you see how the body can be seen through lines. You see the circle and the square in the background. Um, this is a seated image. This is again a rigorously conceived plan. I'm showing you more the structure and the grid. First to you, here is a dancer in motion. These, this is Bharatanatyam posture. And what you see here in these eight figures is how when the body moves, how the body is moving in different, very clear cut lines. Here are the different positions of the legs. This is a lovely, lovely image of the Vishnu Trivi Karma. And here you see how the two legs of Vishnu are spread. And on the right hand side here, you are seeing how the lines of both the eight armed Vishnu can be seen. Now, of course, this is the most important figure, which and the most, um, how should I say, um, the popular figure in Indian art, which you see maximum who has been represented by painters, particularly by sculptors. And of course, this has become a household name, thanks to the Chola bronzes, this is the image of Nataraj, Shiva as the Lord of Dance, which is Shiva Nataraj. The earlier image, of course, you had seen also could be 
with Vishnu Trivi Karma, it, there's also the image which is also known as the Bhujanga Trasita, Karna pose, which is known literally frightened by a snake, where, let me quick, yeah, where you see the left leg is held right across the body. This is just to show you a similarity between the two poses. Now let me go back to the Nataraj pose. Now the study of iconography, I'm going to jump here, is the study of iconography. And what you see, the study of iconography, uh, 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 pioneers like Sri Aurobindo, Anand Kumar Swami, and Havel were at pains to talk about in great measure. They were talking, they were actually, I don't know why they did it, but I suppose it was required to make it more universal. They were defending the multiple heads and arms of Indian images and also the interpretation and significance in terms of the uh, concepts of formlessness, which is arupa, even going beyond the form to pararupa, to vyakta, which is full form, and avyakta, which is devoid of form. But here, what I want to show you is in the image, I'm just trying to see if we have a Nataraj image later. Uh, let me just see. I don't think I have a Nataraj image. Okay. Now I'm going to just go back to the line image of the Nataraj to just tell you. We look at all these lovely images in leisure. Now, here there are five most important elements which talk of the Panchakriya or the five acts of Nataraj. One of them is Srishti or creation, where if you see the left rare arm carries the hourglass shaped damaru, the vibrations of which creates the universe. Some conflate this with the big bang theory of cosmic creation. The second kriya is that of samhara or destruction, where the raised rare right hand carries the fire that atrophies matter to a formless state only for regeneration. In that sense, it is the fire of transformation, not destruction. This implies constant change, echoing the Buddhist precept of there's no being, only becoming. Then there is srishti, or maintenance or protection. The open palm of the forehand indicates an assurance. There is nothing to fear about constant cosmic overhaul. Change is normal. Then we have here a tirobhava or concealment, where the hidden lower left palm pointing downwards says that Shiva is the creator of Maya, illusion, or the veil of ignorance. Then we have anugraha or blessing or liberation, where the raised left foot combined with the closed hand signifies the option available before the seeker. Moksha or liberation from ignorance and by implication from the cycle of birth and death. Then here, of course, because it's more of a line drawing, but in an image which you see in sculpture, stone, or in the Chola bronzes, you have the Muyalaka or Apasmara, which is the dwarf demon at Nataraja's feet, which represents the evils of ignorance and ego to be trampled upon. The ego has to be trampled upon, and that is what Muyalaka or Apasmara has to be trampled upon, which should be shown to trampling to rise to a higher plane of self-actualization. And then finally, as you see, 
the circle of fire the frame around nataraj is maya or illusion as experienced through a cyclical phenomenon of birth and death um now what we will see as i go along i will show you some of the revealed work which through literally i'm taking you through a time machine of indian art you see the relief work in the udaygiri caves you see the boar avatar holding the prithvi on his boar vishnu look at the way the thai is placed you can see that these are almost looking like lines which are frozen in time which become sculptures this is a dancing figure relief work on an udaygiri cave ajanta beautiful the dancing figures the central figure could almost look like a odishi dancer or an urisi dancer as we call them now this is the great brihadeshwara temple a yogini temple built in the area of thanjavu in the 11th century before the common era just have a look just see these beautiful dynamic frozen movements in time in the external facades of temple of course hoysala art in karnataka which is so overly ornamented 12th century of the common era which when you look at them again these are beautiful apsaras which are dancing on the external facades you see a different kind of dancing figures in the temples in konara but all of them you can make out very clearly where the line is being shown where the human figuration is being explored by sculptors and painters i'm just uh, showing you some that was hoysala now i'm moving down to andhra pradesh to the vipakshi temple where again you are seeing how the dancer is using his body as a brush drawing very very strong lines this is absolutely stunning these are the you know movements the different kernels of dance on pillars in fact many of the dance uh, classical dances whether it is urisi dance whether it is bharatanatyam whether it is mohiniattam many of them are kind of being recreated through the different aspects of dance which are shown in different uh, natya mandirs of various temples traditional temples in india this is again dancing and praying figures painted at the lipakshi temple i'm now moving up north to himachal pradesh and i'm going to show you a similar kind of a circle of dance which is being done by matis much in uh, almost 100 years later just just keep this in mind when you are looking at these figures this is a beautiful story of bhasma sura uh, 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 who is being uh, where where vishnu in the form of mohini is uh, you know killing or uh, destroying the demon bhasma sura uh, in 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 the form uh so that he touches his head and he's completely destroyed that will be the way to die and shiva from behind is making sure that the asma sura will self destroy himself um i'm going to skip to this here are these patachitras which you see much later popular art from the kali ghat paintings in uh, the kali temple in kolkata in west bengal and i'm jumping on to mf hussain one of our most celebrated modernists who really enjoyed painting dancers he also made a movie called gatagami minakshi which was really beautiful where he took one of our most beautiful uh, actresses madhuri dikshit to be the protagonist of his film and how he used the body to show uh, how uh, 
you know, it becomes uh, the house which reuses art completely uh, where, the, where the human body starts painting uh, with, 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 with its own body. This is another dancing Ganesh made by M.F. Hussain. And now I'm showing you some art with, to make it more universal. William Blake's uh, uh, poetry, which is where you see Oberon, Titania, and Puck with fairies dancing. William Blake is, this is his interpretation. This is Mori Toulouse Dautrec, uh, the dancers at the Moulin Rouge, 19th century. Uh, this is Edward Degas, who painted a lot of dancers too. Uh, this is, of course, Dupy, uh, the Le Bal Populaire, the local dance, 20th century. And this is what I was saying, Mugi Matisse again, 20th century, which was very similar in composition to the Boulet painting of Himachal Pradesh. And of course, Royal Liechtenstein were coming into the 20th century, the artist studio, the dance. Keith Herring, 20th century, look at the way he has made it more graphic, showing the dancers. Now, here I am so sorry, the spelling of Shivaji is wrong, but here is a Mohini Atam performance by uh, the daughter of Bharti Shivaji, which you can see here. Uh, then Biju Maharaj, one of the greatest masters, uh, dancing and the lines of his body uh, being so very, very clear in this contemporary dance where the body is used in a more free flowing manner less structured, less formal, Akram Khan. And then I want to come to Chandralekha. She, in fact, used her body very, very much um, in, 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 in a geometric manner where line was very, very predominant. She was completely unapologetic about the way she broke the form of Bharatanatyam and brought in a different kind of physicality and sexuality in her dance. In fact, Chandralekha brought in yoga and Kalairi Payatu into dance, which was very, very revolutionary in her time. But now what we see is in changing choreographies, of course, she was very avant-garde in her time. She was very revolutionary. But now we see a lot of dancers borrowing heavily from different uh, aspects of even the martial arts and bringing it into their own choreographies. In fact, she uh, uh, brought, uh, she went beyond prettiness and piety. In fact, she hilariously called it a dollification of conventional Bharatanatyam and, uh, you know, moved in various uh, territories where very, very formal, classically trained dancers did not because they thought it was really disrespecting the dance form. But creativity, in my opinion, has no boundaries and pushing the envelope of creativity sometimes means that you break the form. It is like how Tayyap Mehta broke the form in painting when he brought in a different diagonality and cutting the form, particularly in a series called the Manish Mardini. I now want to end actually with a, a, a person who trained with uh, Chandralekha, uh, the most beautiful, talented, uh, extraordinary Ishani Doshi, who is here performing her book, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods. She was a disciple of Chandralekha, but she moved even beyond. She's a poet, she's a writer, she's a yoga practitioner, and has been performing Chandralekha's choreography of Sharia for 15 years. She has been performing, this was the last of Chandralekha's uh, uh, choreography, Sharira, and she engages, Tishani engages with Sharira in Chandralekha's presence and absence. And she has internalized 
a world of ideas, emotions, people, and relationships through the piece. So, you know, for me, Pishani Sharida is really a coming together of all um, my ideas, and that is why I chose this particular kind of piece to show you, because, you know, it also shows an interdisciplinary between the different uh, genres of dance. It brings in yoga, it brings in a different way of looking at the body, using both the traditional, the modern, and the contemporary. And this is actually where we are in India. Contemporary India is not just one India, it is many, many Indias. And there is no one particular way of thinking, whether it is in dance, it is in music. And that is why I love the idea of Kiryana when she said dance across genres. And this is what I have really um, enjoyed. And I truly enjoyed looking or re-looking at the various sculptures, the paintings which were there, very much part of our heritage, bringing it to modern artists like M.F. Hussain, to Birju Maharaj, and ending with the very contemporary, with the very um, uh, interdisciplinary, with the transdisciplinary, and crossing many boundaries of space, time, and body, Ishani Joshi. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. And I want to thank Ilyana once again for doing this wonderful uh, interdisciplinary dialogue on dance. Thank you so much, Alka. Really, um, you have uh, you have brought us from the very ancient time, uh, and uh, you said that, that you were go you went to to go back and back, and then you are you have been able within half an hour to cross uh, so much space and so much time, and to give so many shapes and images in front of our eyes. Well, uh, so many uh, inputs were there in your, in your talk. Suddenly, I, I, um, since you started from uh, the lines, then I, st uh, I uh, suddenly thought, uh, what would be the best way of writing dance? Means, uh, writing dance means to, to, yeah, to, to develop a, a a writing system of a composition, of a choreography, of a, of, of a dance. Uh, because many attempts are there. Of course, uh, in the West, uh, we know that, uh, that uh, the Laban system and uh, many, many have tried to, but in, for us, for Indian dance, still uh, a proper system is not there. And, um, I remember that my guru, uh, Guruji uh, Padma Bhushana Kiluchana Mahapatra, he tried to, um, to draw, to, to, to write down his composition, and it was a drawing, and it was a, uh, those miniature poses just drawn uh, in all the details for each bit of the tala. And uh, of course, it's a very lengthy, lengthy process. But again, it was going back to the... Um, to the sculpture, to the poses, to the to, to the to the carve of the body, and the and the so uh, so utilizing this uh, concept of the the fact that the lines uh, are are basic for for uh, for the dance and and for the sculpture and for the painting. So maybe one should could utilize it also for a system of writing dance. Well, mine is not just is not much of a of a question. It was just a, one of the considerations, one of the thoughts that came by by listening to you. And then of course I enjoyed the, the reference to MF Hussein, where I, I had the um, privilege to choreograph uh, one of uh, the sequence of the Minakshi, a tale of three cities. And I could see how 
this great uh, artist was enjoying uh, like his, his, a child while uh, we were uh, shooting the, the dance scenes in the middle of the night under the rain. And uh, he was just, uh, he, he was not like a director of a film. He was just a child enjoying like anything, looking at the dancer and the, all the, the splashing of the rain around and, uh, and the movement. And uh, really it was, um, it was great to, to see him in that, in that uh, role of, um, as a spectator more than a film director. So now I don't know if uh, um, there are, uh... okay, Arsha is uh, commenting. I, I wonder if you, uh, wonderful as always, Alka, I wonder if you would like to, to say something about the Ragini, Ras, Ragini, Rasa, and miniatures that comes out of lines, but lines of words. Uh, Ragini, Rasa, and miniatures that comes out of lines, but lines of words. Mm. Okay, I'll take that, um, Ileana. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inputs as well. And thank you so much for commenting on the presentation and I'm glad to know that, uh, you know, working with a visual artist as a dancer and choreographing, uh, you know, I'm sure there must have been wonderful energies between you and uh, Hussein Sahab because he himself was a man of great performance. You know, he actually performed while he painted. He was a great performer. Um, thank you for your question, Arshia. Um, it's, it's very, very interesting. And of course, the different ragamalas, which have been done particularly by the Rajasthani miniature artists and the artists of the Kangra Kalam, uh, this has been a, a quite a favorite, uh, how should I say, it's almost like a book illustration. Uh, the ragaragini, uh, music, poetry, rasa, have always been the engagement of traditional artists in India. Because as I said, going back to the Natya Shastra, traditional art in India has always been a performer was a, was a dancer, a dancer was a poet, a, a poet could also be a sculptor, uh, could also be a painter. You know, it's the story of, uh, it takes me also back to the story of Vajra uh, and, uh, in the Markande Puran of the Vishnu Dharmottar Puran, where Vajra goes to the Rishi and says, Oh, Master, teach me the art of painting. To which he says, Do you know the art of sculpture? To which he says, No, Master, teach me the art of sculpture. To which he says, Do you know the art of dance? To which he says, Oh, Master, teach me the art of dance. He said, But then do you know the art of music? Because that is the most abstract of it all. So if you see, even in the story of the Markande uh, Puran, what do you see? That there is such a deep kind of interrelationship between dance, music, poetry, sculpture. So going back to your question, Arshia, of line in words and words in line, it is almost kind of interchangeable. So when the traditional artist looked or understood the Raga Ragini or looked at the way he represented, say, for example, the Todi Ragini, or he looked at the different Naikas, whether it is the Abhisarika Naika going into the dark, where she battles everything, going to meet her lover, whether there are serpents or no serpents. So all these things are kind of what did the what did the painter actually do? He or they were primarily he's at that point, but the painter we know only by name of he's at that time went into a deep meditation and also read the texts, whatever texts they were illustrating. Suppose they were illustrating that. Mewadi Ragmala. So in that, the Mewadi artist read the text. What did each rag convey to him? What was his feeling at that point? And then he kind of drew the painting. And therefore, the lines emerged out of 
him ingesting something, digesting it, and then producing something which came both from his mind and his hand. And then, in fact, that's what they say, it is a devakala. All these arts were devakalas, whether it was a dancer, whether it was a gotipua in the temple, whether in Urisa, or whether it was a devadasi who was performing for even the people who were constructing the Brihadeshwara temple for Shiva, what were they doing? They were actually making an offering to the divine. So these were all devakalas. As the painter himself was painting the ragini, the, what, what was the various rasas which came into it? So in the Natyashastra, where the rasa theory is first expounded, it actually centered around the eight rasas there. Finally, the last rasa was added much later in the 17th century by Abhinav Gupta, which was the Shanta Rasa. But basically emotions, the theory of emotions, the structure of making the body according to the canons which were laid down in the Shilpa Shastras, the icons which were the, there's a whole study of iconography. So all these things came together. And finally, the according to the, Shad Anga, where it is the six forms of the human body, one head, two arms, one torso, and two legs. So the Shad Anga, that became very important. Again, the human figure becomes very important, where you have Varnika Mangam, you have Lavanya, you have Versimilitude. All these things came together to make a piece of art. So the translation from dance to painting and from painting into dance was quite, quite interchangeable. So that is how I would express lines of words and words of lines and rasa. Uh, does that answer what you wanted, uh, uh, Arsha? Is, is that, uh, is that uh, fine? I mean, that's the way I look at it. Am I able to communicate? My uh, it, it, maybe maybe they could unmute Arsha uh, Mike from from the okay okay it's not. <laughs> that uh, today dancers go to paintings. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you, uh, Alka, for a very very exhaustive answer thanks a lot it is really remarkable how to flesh out dance today dance choreographies compositions new wor works dancers are going back to the uh, sculptures going back to the paintings and getting their inspiration from there so you see it was linked in the past and it continues to be linked together and it's almost magical how the dance emerges inspired by the artwork so thank you very much. And Ileana, thanks a lot. This is amazing. Yeah, it's, it's actually uh, what, what we know is that uh, in the 50s of the last centuries, when uh, dance in Orissa, for example, it was almost uh, gone and disappeared, this uh, few uh, entrepreneurs, the gurus, the pioneers, uh, who, who were in theater, who were self-made, uh, uh, not yet dancer, but because they had to take from so many sources here and there, it was all scattered. So the temples uh, were actually the textbook. Uh, so all of them, they, they really, in their experiences, they keep on uh, telling that uh, they, they had to go back and study this culture. It was like an open textbook uh, with the frozen uh, poses. This is incredible because I live in the middle of this temple, so uh, I sometimes I think uh, actually the poses, the Alasakanya poses, some uh, some of them are Nartaki, are, are, are dance poses, but most of them are just uh, one lady is looking at the mirror, the other is talking at the parrots, the other one is have the, the baby uh, uh, in her hands, the other one is tying the ankle, so they are just doing uh, actions. The, the daily daily action, but so gracefully, gracefully, and so uh, elegantly, and and that that we see in that dance poses. But actually, who are, who were these these ladies? Who 
I mean, I, I, I ask myself, I, I wonder from where they were all in the imagination of the sculptor or there they were, who were these ladies at that point in the sixth, seventh, sixth, seventh century, eighth century when this temple started to, 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 to come up. So it's, it's, a, it's a mystery. I mean, uh, these beautiful uh, uh, ladies within this, um, that as I said, maybe they were not dancing, but they were, they were, they are, they are poses, they were like dance poses. So this is, uh, yeah. I don't know if there is any other question. Yeah, I have one thing I want to say, and I don't know whether you can tell me to shut up because I'm hogging up all the time, but. Uh, so <laughs> no, Asha, you, you were expected. <laughs> tell, tell, tell. Okay. So, uh, very nice that, uh, you know, we are bringing up this thing about linkages between contemporary practice uh, of traditional dance and the linkages with uh, sculpture and uh, um, painting. Um, and you've cited the example of ODC, which really is the best example to illustrate this point. But that's probably the best known example as well. There is another example that comes to mind, and I would like to say it. And Alka, I would urge you to see if you could uh, explore something in this direction also. So there is a temple in uh, Warangal uh, today, I think, today, uh, modern day Telangana, the Ramappa temple. I think it has either just got the World Heritage Site status or it's uh, it's uh, already been inscribed or is in the process of being is inscribed. And there every thousand pillars carried sculptures of this dance, which today we know as Perini. And there is reference to Perini in, um, in some texts, but it was a dead dance. It had died out like Lukthogya and all that, you know, uh, being vulnerable to the ravages of time. And it is only by looking at these sculptures and the few references that you find in text, um, I think particularly, uh, uh, what is, do you remember the name? Natya Rangini or something like that, its name is. Um, Raj, Ra, 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 yeah. You know which one I'm talking about. It'll come back to yeah, me. But any anyway, the time expert, yeah. was reconstructed. Now, what we know is that the moments of pause in the dance, and it's a literally a pause-free dance. It's one of those breathless kind of dances. But if you were to take quick, quick pictures, they each picture matches to one of the sculptural images. But we don't know whether the dance was really like that or not. So a lot of imagination is used by contemporary people also to put together. While you talk about the imagination of who were these women, the question is that a lot of, were these men dancing what we today know as Perini is the question. But the link is the same. It's sculptures coming to life to revive a dance that was finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, my story. Because basically the, the poses are frozen. So you have to, from one pose to another, you, you built up the dance. You so have to create that. One pose to the other portion is created. The poses are there, and but from that one to the, the passage, other. The passage is what, what the, the dance yeah. is. Yeah. So since you've made such an exhaustive study, I wonder, Alka, if you would like to also look at the uh, Ramapa temple in Warangal sure. and story of the rebirth of Perini. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Arshia. I will. Thank you very much for an absolutely amazing and scintillating conversation. You know, these make my evenings for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think if uh, there is no other uh, question, I, I would like to again uh, thank Alka and uh, all the people who have been with us. And um, I hope to carry you, all of you again for tomorrow when we have uh, another uh, generous uh, dance and film. So um, thank you so much to everybody. And uh, good thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you, Ileana. Thank you.